the Byzantines never called themselves Byzantines. Up to the day the Turks took Constantinople, they referred to themselves as Romayoi, Romans, and remained keenly aware that their emperors were the heirs of Caesar and Augustus. Describing the medieval incarnation of the Eastern Roman Empire as the Byzantine Empire is nothing more than a traditional and sometimes misleading convention. The distinction is useful, however, to the degree that it reflects the profound transformation of Roman society during the millennium after the fall of the Western Empire. The chronological division between Roman and Byzantine is most often placed in the 7th century when generations of almost continuous warfare with the Persians, Slavs, and Arabs reduced the Eastern Roman Empire to an impoverished fragment of its former self. Throughout this crisis, the intellectual heritage of antiquity remained alive in the schools and monasteries of Constantinople. As the empire revived, that heritage would spark a cultural renaissance. But at least on the popular level, a great deal of knowledge about the past had been lost during the crises of the 7th and 8th centuries. The identities of ancient statues that loomed over the public places of Constantinople, for example, were forgotten, and the statues themselves came to be regarded as magical talismans. Ancient ruins and temples, likewise, were dreaded as the homes of demons. At every level of Byzantine society, knowledge of Latin became rare outside legal circles, whose members had to read the works of Roman jurists. Although closer contacts with Western Europe encouraged a modest revival in Latin learning from the 11th century onward, very few Byzantines ever read Latin texts for pleasure. Byzantine students were not normally exposed to works of Roman history. Although they might be introduced to a few famous characters, such as Caesar and Nero, in the context of rhetorical exercises, they knew even these as little more than names. Only those with a special interest in the Roman past read more deeply. Such scholars were rare, but, as we'll see, they had important resources at their disposal. Before we discuss those, a few words about this video's sponsor. Art is an important source for Byzantine history. This famous mosaic of Justinian at San Vitale, for example, provides fascinating glimpses into imperial iconography and late antique clothing. Art, however, doesn't just teach us about history. It can also help us improve our own futures. 2022 was the worst year for stocks since the 2008 crisis. Yet, despite the trillions lost in the market, art auctions hit a record high, performing better than at any point in the past 270 years. This resilience is why art collecting didn't end with kings and emperors, but was kept alive by magnates like Rockefeller and continues with modern CEOs. Today's sponsor, Masterworks, offers you access to the same art that billionaires invest in. Masterworks has been featured in financial publications like Business Insider and Financial Times. More importantly, Masterworks returned over $25 million to their investors last year, including selling two paintings for a 10 and 35% net return to their members to finish off 2022. Don't worry, Masterworks is qualified with the SEC and doesn't deal in NFTs or crypto. You're investing in real, physical paintings. Masterworks has over 600,000 members. But use the link below, and your account will be preloaded with priority access. Back to Byzantium. Even after the crises of the 7th and 8th centuries, Greek histories of the classical Roman Empire could still be found at Constantinople and were still being read. During the 9th century, for example, the scholar and sometime patriarch Photius produced summaries of nearly 400 works about half of them pre-Christian, which he had read. His list included Roman historians of the classical period, notably Appian, chronicler of the civil wars that ended the Republic. Although the breadth of Photius's reading was exceptional, the essentials of Roman history were available to every literate Byzantine via the chronicles that comprised the most popular and enduring form of Byzantine historiography. These works pioneered in late antiquity by Eusebius of Caesarea and other patristic authors, 
were essentially religious in character, focused on salvation history and the growth of the church. They made reference, however, to the chronological framework of the Roman monarchy, republic, and empire. A more substantial, if diffuse, account of Roman history was available in the sprawling 10th century encyclopedia known as the Suda. Although most of the historical entries in this very popular work dealt with late antiquity, about a third explored such topics as the institutions of the Roman Republic, biographies of early Roman emperors, and Trajan's Wars of Conquest. Perhaps the most intriguing Middle Byzantine survey of Roman history is Michael Sellis's Historia Sintumos, written for the benefit of his pupil, the future emperor Michael VII. Beginning with Romulus and the kings of Rome, Sellos covers the foundation of the Republic, and then skips ahead to Caesar, Augustus, and their successors, providing a brief, moralizing biography of each emperor. The fall of the Western Roman Empire is ignored, and the string of imperial lives extended to Basil II, who died in 1025, only a generation before Sellos was writing. By Sellos's time, many classical texts existed in only a handful of copies, and were correspondingly likely to disappear, whether from simple neglect or in one of the fires that periodically swept Constantinople. The Crusader sack of 1204, for example, seems to have destroyed a considerable part of the classical literature that had survived to that point, including a number of histories. Yet despite the slow disappearance of ancient literature, educated Byzantines never forgot their Roman roots. Not long before the fall of Constantinople, Emperor Manuel II marveled at the ruins of a city founded by Pompey the Great 14 centuries earlier. On seeing a deserted plain nearby, he reflected, This place must have had a name when it was fortunate enough to be ruled and peopled by Romans. But when I ask what that name was, no one can tell me. Most of the cities are in ruins, and when I ask what they were called, I receive the reply. Men destroyed those cities, but time took their names. This Byzantine emperor, at least, knew how fragile history can be. For more on the relationship between the Byzantines and their Roman roots, check out my interview with Professor Anthony Caldellis. You'll find that video and other episodes of the Toldenstone podcast, along with much more content, on my channel, Toldenstone Footnotes. I have another channel called Scenic Roots of the Past, which is dedicated to historically themed travel. You'll find both channels linked in the description. Please consider joining other viewers in supporting Toldenstone on Patreon. You might also enjoy my book, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants. Thanks for watching.